Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with a roundup of the latest economic reports. Coming up, in Slovakia, NGOs tackle homelessness in innovative ways. And Argentina shifts to luxury wines. First, the headlines. Asian bourses fell as Asian currencies gained on dollar weakness overnight following soft U.S. economic data. The dollar fell 1% against a basket of currencies to a fresh three-month low as weak U.S. retail sales data stirred concerns about the economic recovery. Japan's Nikkei was down 1%. Australia's S&P ASX 200 fell 0.3%, and Taiwan's TIEX was down 1.2%. As U.S. market weakness extends into the second quarter, a rate increase by the Federal Reserve this summer becomes much less likely. EU states that have accepted few asylum seekers will have to shoulder a heavier burden under a new mandatory system proposed by Brussels. Asylum seekers would be spread among EU members via a quota system based on population, GDP, unemployment, and the number of asylum claims. At the heart of the proposal is an emergency distribution plan that would be activated whenever a country faces a mass influx of people. Italy is expected to receive more than 200,000 migrants by the Mediterranean this year. But London has vowed to oppose the proposals and is the only large country to do so. Oil slipped on Thursday as weak data from the world's top economies raised concern about the outlook for global fuel demand. June Brent crude fell to $66.63 a barrel in early morning trade, while U.S. crude for June delivery dropped to $60.21. Crude stocks in the United States fell for the second week by 2.2 million barrels, following four months of steady gains. And though the number of rigs in the U.S. has plunged by 60 percent in response to lower oil prices, U.S. crude production has only lessened marginally in recent weeks. The International Energy Agency warned that the global oil glut is building and consumption growth is still too weak to absorb supply. Greece slid back into recession in the first quarter of 2015, just months after exiting a six-year depression. The Greek economy shrank 0.2 percent during the January to March period, following a 0.4 percent decline in the fourth quarter of 2014. The new recession complicates Athens' ability to come to a debt deal, which requires it to run a primary budget surplus. Greece on Wednesday raised 1.14 billion euro in three-month treasury bills to help ward off a dam damaging default. But with 1.5 billion euro due to the IMF in June, and then more than 6 billion euro to the European Central Bank in July and August, the future looks bleak. What needs to be done immediately so that we restore liquidity, which is the um, most important issue at the moment as far as the Greek economy is concerned, is to proceed with the necessary deep reforms that the uh, Greek economy requires so that we can return back to the path of growth. Despite raising borrowing costs to stem inflation, the Bank of Ghana failed to stop its currency from plunging to an all-time low on Wednesday. The city lost as much as 1.7 percent, hitting a low of 3.955 against the dollar, following a surprise 1 percentage point rate hike to 22 percent. Ghana's currency has tumbled by 18 percent in 2015 as the country that was long one of Africa's top performers suffered from a fall in global commodity prices. Accra took a $918 million bailout loan from the IMF in March to plug a budget deficit forecast to come in at 7.5 percent of GDP this year. As countries worldwide continue to struggle in the wake of the Great Recession, homelessness has grown in line with unemployment. The following report takes a look at how an NGO in Slovakia actively approaches the issue to improve the situation both for the homeless as well as the society they live in. Passengers running to catch their trains, sights and sounds that are classic in this station in Bratislava, Slovakia. And even more classical are these porters neatly shaven and dressed in elegant uniforms. Nothing suggests that these seven men, 
are actually a part of some 5,000 homeless in the city. Who asks for help? Younger or older people, pregnant women, mothers with strollers. Today I think I helped people carrying at least 50 bags. I'm not counting how many, but I think it was a lot. This is an opportunity they got through the Slovak NGO Proti Perdu. Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., they help passengers with their luggage. In exchange, the organization pays them. This program really helps me. This organization gives me some money. Our baggage porters are our employees. They get paychecks from us. They work under the same rules as any other worker. And this is not the first initiative of this type. Vagus, another Slovak NGO, also provides jobs for the homeless. Two months ago, three of them have also been hired for a new cafe in Bratislava. This phenomenon may continue a hidden upturn in the job market. In March, the unemployment rate stood at 12 percent. It's the lowest since 2009. The economic data from China is a mixed bag. It has been nearly half a year since China started easing its monetary policy, with little sign of a rebound in growth. Nevertheless, the downturn appears to be fading, as even the property market has cooled down some. For more on the situation in China, we're joined by analyst Sam Chester from investment management firm Clarity Capital. Mr. Chester. It's a pleasure. Pleasure Thanks for here. joining us. So, I mean, what exactly is going on here in China? What, what exactly would you point to in the performance? Are we seeing an improvement or not? So as you said, there are pluses and minuses from the data that was released just this week about China's macroeconomic scenario. Yeah. Um, some of the negative mar remarks, as you said, there's been a very sluggish response to the government's uh, easing of the monetary uh, supply, which were the, everyone around the world was really hoping to see broader improvement in the economy in response to that. Um, but on the plus side, China's downturn seems to be easing off, uh, particularly looking at property markets, which perhaps we can get into a little bit more. I think the one key indicator you can really look at mm -hmm. would be fixed asset investment. Um, fixed asset investment dropped by almost two percentage points over the last quarter, which is significant. Much of that was due to a drop in um, property investment, which dropped to 6% right. after, in the past year, in 2014, it was almost 15%. So that's pretty significant. The positive sheen on that that you can add, though, is that the government over the last few months has been pouring money into infrastructure, something that the Chinese government has traditionally done. And just as they've done it in the past with success, it's worked now as well. And that's one of the reasons why fixed asset investment, which is the key indicator many people look at, has dropped, but it hasn't dropped as much as we might have feared. Right. Well, at the same time, I mean, uh, you know, pouring money into infrastructure has been a, a policy of, of Beijing for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly opinions that say this is part of the reason why China is in the situation that it's in. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the housing crisis, can you call it a crisis, would you say that it's imminent? Well. Uh, to, uh, but before I answer your question, I would just take a step back and say, how have we gotten here? Why is the Chinese economy in a slowdown? After all, many people, when they've been looking at China over the last few years, for decades, China's been posting over 10% economic growth, something which you don't see anywhere else in the world and we've come right. to expect. There really are three key uh, reasons behind the current slowdown, which has been going on now for the last you know, two or three years. The first one is structural. And structural, fundamentally, is just like a company. As companies grow larger and larger, it's much harder to maintain the same pace of growth. So too with countries. Um, looking at that a little bit more deeply, economic growth is a function of labor, capital, and productivity. In terms of labor, China's youth uh, population capped out in 2012, and ever since then it's on the decline. In terms of capital, China's capital investment is almost at 50 percent higher than anywhere else in the world. It can't get any higher. So again, it's not growing. And right. then in terms of productivity, China's nearing the rate of other advanced economies in the world in certain areas, and therefore its productivity also can't rise. So that's structurally. Essentially, after growing over 10 percent for three decades, it couldn't really maintain that pace, and that's why you've seen it fall back now to about 7 percent. The other two things I would just touch on very briefly would be the policy element and the cyclical element. The policy element is that unlike past Chinese presidents, the current Chinese president, Xi Jinping, who's been in power since 2000, 2013 has changed pace and has said we will accept slower economic growth in order to advance structural reform. So that's something key in that from Beijing you're looking at a different perspective. And the last point, which ties into what you asked me about the housing markets, is that cyclically, which is in terms of the market's ups and downs, you're seeing that after China borrowed a lot of money in 2009 in order to push through the global financial crisis. It's also hedging itself from the from Essentially. The and then a lot of that debt, I mean, debt in China right now is almost at 250 percent more than GDP. And a lot of that debt has been transferred in to the housing market, mm -hmm. which leads to the concern mm -hmm. of many people around the world 
about a crisis in the real estate sector in China. Okay, well, we're going to have to end here. Thank you so very much, Mr. Sam Chester from Clary Capital. And also, uh, happy birthday on your 30th birthday. A pleasure as always. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Argentina, the world's fifth largest wine producer, is turning to high-end products to save plummeting exports of its cheaper brands. And while some wine producers have turned to the domestic market, a 4% drop in wine consumption has not helped. Boutique winery Huarpe, in Argentina's famous Mendoza wine region, started in 2003, right after the country's last economic crisis. For a decade, the bodega grew rapidly along with the rest of the industry due to high demand abroad for its quality and low-priced bottles. But drastic changes in the past three years, like rising costs, have forced wine producers to focus their marketing strategy on high-end wines. We haven't increased prices, but we are selling more expensive wines because we produce better quality. So we have changed our portfolio to more premium products, and that's what helps us survive. Argentina's soaring inflation rate, that private economists put between 30 and 40 percent, has increased labor and transport costs dramatically. As a result, winemakers struggle to make a profit with low-cost wines, which used to be their traditional strength. But selling more expensive bottles also means selling fewer of them. The quantity of exported wine fell over 16% in 2014, according to the Argentine Wine Institute. Because we can no longer compete in the $10 category, we can't grow much. We had ambitious plans to grow, but our sales are not climbing as much as they could. That's because we are no longer competitive in the categories where it's easier to sell big quantities. Many wine producers have turned to the domestic market to make up for the loss in exports. But a 4% drop in wine consumption, a worldwide trend, hasn't helped. Though the situation looks grim for the industry's 400,000 employees, Argentina still has a unique asset which made its name originally. No one has a Malbec like Argentina. There are good Malbecs in California and Chile, but not the same type and quantity as in Argentina. 40% of Argentine exports are Malbec. The Malbec's enduring success, new high-quality varieties and possible new inflation-busting policies after elections in October give some hope for a brighter future and something to toast to. And now for a look at what else is new in the economy in Media Watch. Daniel, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Good. So what do you have for us today? The New York Times. This is the epitome of Media Watch. Uh, Bill McKibben, who is one of the founders of 350.org, a major uh, a nonprofit organization that works in trying to curb climate change, wrote mm -hmm. an op-ed there reacting to President Obama's decision to give free license, uh, well, not quite free license, but uh, open up the Arctic for oil exploration, for shell oil. Uh, to a controversial it, issue. It's clearly. very controversial. Uh, Bill McKibben basically wrote uh, the, the following, and I quote, the Obama administration's decision to give Shell Oil the go-ahead to drill in the Arctic shows why we may never win the fight against climate change. Uh, this is uh, not some person who's out on the fringe. He's really at the center of this struggle. Uh, and he's saying this decision is big, and it really sort of re re uh, re in, uh, iterates why why we we why have we are so in the situation we are in today essentially which is you know you see President Obama you see him giving speeches like he did at the White House press correspondence dinner make, you know making very bold statements uh, yes. saying here's the problem we have with climate change and then going ahead and making decisions like this where all of the experts say that there's very high chances, 75% chances, that there will be a spill in the right. first few years of pumping Not oil. Not to mention the fact that, of course, with the, with, the, with the global oil market the way it is today, I mean, it's not very economical to begin with. It, it right. will take a long time, you know, of course, depending on where the oil market goes, for it to actually be profitable. Right. And so, you know, this is, again, one of those moments we see that, in actuality, economics and environmentalism are one and the same. You look at it from both angles, and you see it's not worth it and it's not worth it. And this is what Bill McKibben's writing about is 
even though it's not worth it, we have ostensibly uh, uh, a president who really believes that climate change is one of the central issues facing humanity, who's making this kind of decision at the end of the day. And this is the real fear. He's talking about Republicans who out and out deny climate change. Right. But then you got Democrats in America who, who say that they believe that this is a real problem, but then make decisions that don't reflect that kind of belief. So well, the power system... As is, they say, money talks and... Yeah, we yes. don't have to finish that, but I'm sure Absolutely. most people know how to finish that sentence. Indeed. <laughs> yes, well, Danny Roth, it's, uh, it's very daunting indeed to hear of this uh, situation, and we'll see how things play out. Absolutely. As uh, Obama's uh, final term, so to speak, in office. Uh, yeah, last, out. last few, last year or so. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks. That is the end of our Economy Magazine for today. I'm Benjamin Chang Faris. Thanks for joining us.